All right, I'm so excited to, to be doing this class with you. And um, I want to start off, first of all, by emphasizing how important I think it will be that we make this a, a round discussion and, and a conversation that has as many dimensions as there are people in the chat. Um, I will simply be presenting one interpretive lens and um, and hopefully one that will spark further conversation among among all of us. Uh, but that's all that's all I want it it really to be. Uh, and I hope that the the book can can speak for itself. You all have signed up for this for this Zoom class, and so presumably you don't need to be convinced uh, to read the the Book of Certitude, the Kitabi Gan. But I did want to begin by offering some comments about why, if one wasn't convinced that one should read the Kitabi Yagan, why one sh why one should read it. And I have a few categories that uh, that I want to offer. And the first one is that we want to read the Kitabi Yagan to be informed. Uh, and by informed, I mean it is a repository of information about the Baha'i teachings. Uh, Shoghi Effendi has told us in many different letters just how important this book is, uh, a book of unsurpassed preeminence among the doctrinal writings of the Baha'i dispensation. So this is our preeminent doctrinal work. He said it's the most important book written on the spiritual significance of the cause. He said it's the most important book wherein Baha'u'llah explains the basic beliefs of the faith, that it contains the very essence of the teachings. Um, and that reminds me of what Baha'u'llah said about, about the hidden words, that, uh, that it also represents a kind of summation of what was revealed to the prophets of old. So the, the Kitab Yagan and the hidden words can both be seen as kind of summaries of, of an, an immense amount of, of spiritual potency and inspiration. Shoghi Effendi has, has said that it's the most fundamental book on the Baha'i Revelation. And Baha'u'llah himself has said in the Kitab Yagan that all the scriptures and the mysteries thereof are condensed into this brief account. So we want to read the Kitab Yagan because it's important and because it has information that we want. But a second reason why we want to read the Book of Certitude is to be changed by it, not just to be informed, but to be transformed. And this is something that I can only claim, uh, and uh, and the actual accomplishment of this will have to be up to you. But I can guarantee you that this book can change the way you think about religion. It can change the way you think about God. It can change the way you think about prophets of God, why they come, who they are. It can radically alter the way you think about sacred texts. But also, it, it can not only change us personally, but it can change the world. Uh, and that is a claim, I think, of, of Baha'u'llah about, about this text. Shoghi Effendi has put it in a, in a, in beautifully in God Passes By. He says that of all the books revealed by the author of the Baha'i Revelation, this book alone by sweeping away the age-long barriers that have so insurmountably separated the great religions of the world, has laid down a broad and unassailable foundation for the complete and permanent reconciliation of their followers. So it's a huge claim that this book contains the key to the reconciliation of religious conflict in the world. So there's a, a personal dimension of transformation, and there's a world dimension of transformation that is that is promised in this book. So if those two reasons weren't uh, weren't reason enough to read the Kitab Yagan, I want to add a third reason. And, and I see this as separate from the first two. I think you should read the Kitab Yagan to be enlivened because the words are not just words that inform us and they don't just change the way we think about things, but they bring the power of the spirit. This is an even bigger claim, if possible, than, than the claim uh, under the second point. And I wanted to say a little bit more about this 
power of the word, which seems almost magical or supernatural, uh, but whose but the proof of which lies in the effect it has had on the countless people who have encountered it. An example of one person who has encountered this word in translation, not, fortunately, we don't have to read it in the original language to, to catch the, the notes of this power of the word uh, to, to enliven and to bring about this, this, this second birth, really. Uh, George Townsend, who is a, uh, a canon of the, of the Anglican Church uh, before he became a Baha'i, writes the following about, about the writings of Baha'u'llah. He says, there is a note of music, a voice in the writings of Baha'u'llah, even in translations, which never was heard in English literature before, and which has such power that it seems to shake the air as one reads. If other proof were lacking, this mighty voice would be proof enough. Baha'u'llah, about the power of his own word, says in numerous instances, but here's just a couple. He says, no breeze can compare with the breezes of divine revelation, whilst the word which is uttered by God shineth and flasheth as the sun amidst the books of men. And elsewhere, the word which the one true God uttereth in this day, though that word be the most familiar and commonplace of terms, is invested with supreme with unique distinction. And the great poet Andalib, who lived during the time of Baha'u'llah, has something more specific about the nature of this power. He says, it is the divine word, which is the token and sign of a prophet, the convincing proof to all men in all ages, the everlasting miracle. The essential characteristic of the, of the divine word is the penetrative power. It is not spoken in vain, it compels, it constrains, it creates, it rules, it works in men's hearts, it lives and dies not. And Abdu'l-Baha writing about, about this power says, not but the celestial potency of the word of God, which ruleth and transcendeth the realities of all things, is capable of harmonizing the divergent thoughts sentiments, ideas, and convictions of the children of men. Verily, it is the penetrating power in all things, the mover of souls, and the binder and regulator in the world of humanity. So all of these are just incredible, magical, mythical claims about what you might think are just words on a page. How can words on a page have such power? What kind of a book can do this? What kind of words can do this? And here's really, I'm offering some, some personal uh, notes and, um, and a, a personal inter interpretive angle on it. But when I, when I think of, when I walk into a, a library and ask, well, how are the books organized in the library? It's organized, broadly speaking, into the fiction section and the nonfiction section. And we all have a great intuition as to what goes in, those respective sections of the library. You know, the nonfiction section is information of various kinds, and the fiction section is stories, things that didn't really happen, uh, things that purely proceed from, from our imagination. Now, if we ask ourselves, what category do words like this, these sorts of words, of which the Kitabi Gan is one example, but of which there are other examples in the world, other sacred writings, of other religions throughout history have had similar impact on their followers. How should we categorize these books? Should we put these books into the nonfiction section of the library or should we put them in the fiction section of the library? And does asking that, that question help us a little bit get to get at what it is and what it is not? So I wanna suggest that, that these sacred writings and, and the Kitabi Gan in particular is not a book of nonfiction. It's not a book of history. It's not relating historical facts for us. That's not its primary purpose. Nor should it be judged as such, um, or or weighed in the in light of other kinds of nonfiction books. Baha'u'llah, in regard to his own writing, says, "Weigh not the book of God with such standards and sciences as are current amongst you, for the book itself is the unerring balance established amongst men." 
So Bahala offers a sort of a circular proof. You know, the, the book is its own proof. This is not what we imagine a book of information would be. It's also not a book of fiction in the sense that, in the sense of fiction being stories of people and places and so forth that didn't really happen. Uh, the things that are, are, are strictly speaking false or imaginary. However, it does share something with nonfiction and that it purports to tell us something about reality. Surely that's information of a kind. And it shares something with fiction, even more importantly, and that what at the surface of it may seem to read out as information is really to be understood symbolically and may be told through story and narrative. And it may require a symbolic interpretation to get at what he's saying, much like poetry. In that sense, it, it's something that empowers us to imagine how the world could be in spite of the way that it is. It opens up our imaginations and invites us into a different kind of a world. And I think much of, of part one of the Kitab Yagan we'll find is inviting us into that realm in which the words on the page that we read shouldn't be read out literally as historical accounts, but rather read through to the other side, that the words themselves are symbols, they're placeholders for meanings that, that lie underneath and behind the, world, the words. And in that sense, it's very much um, allied with what we might call um, other forms of, of literature that we don't that we don't ascribe the, the power of revelation, uh, such as uh, such as poetry. And in defense of this of this claim that it shares something with the fiction section of the library, is the story of Joseph in the Quran is called in the Quran itself the best of stories, and Bahala and the Bab both emphasize uh, this this story a great deal uh, in their writings. The first work of the Bab is a commentary on the story of Joseph. Is the story of Joseph, as, as the word implies, as, asan al qisas, you know, the best of stories. Even Muhammad is not saying this is the best of histories. He's saying it's the best of stories. And so it invites us to read sacred writings with a different kind of an eye. And so much of, of the Kitab Yagan, and particularly as we'll see, the first couple of paragraphs of the Kitab Yagan give us keys for how to acquire that different kind of an eye with which we can read and understand these words, which are by and large not to be understood in terms of their outward surface level meanings. If you're interested in going a little bit more into this question of fact, fiction, um, there's a, a wonderful talk by Bahia Nakshavani that was given in, in the year 2000 that's published in the Journal of Baha'i Studies. Uh, and I put a copy of this on the share drive. So what kind of a book is it? What what If it's not fiction or nonfiction, I want to suggest something like it's the Song of Orpheus. The Song of Orpheus, that ancient uh, story of the told of, among the, the ancient Greeks uh, of a man with a harp who was able to charm the very beasts of the field and the trees uh, and, and make them do his bidding. He was able to charm Hades himself to release his, his beloved Eurydice from, uh, from Hades. That story of remote, remote antiquity, um, and no one knows whether this ultimately refers to a historical person or not, it doesn't really matter, because this story has, just as sacred writings do, it has both an external and an internal aspect. Externally, it's a love story about the love of Orpheus for Eurydice and about the inevitability of fate, that he convinces Hades to, to bring his love out of uh out of hell, but it's her fate to remain. But really, I would argue the kernel of this story is about how the divine works in the world and how it needs renewal and how that renewal is affected not by words, but with song, something of a different character than information or the kind of persuasion that mere words can, can offer. So I, I suggest that we can view sacred verses, works of divine revelation, also at least through one lens in mythic terms, that the Kitab Yagan is a sacred narrative for the present day. And part of this narrative 
as Bahá'u'lláh explains in Gleanings, is that the vitality of men's belief in God is dying out in every land. Nothing short of his wholesome medicine can ever restore it. So the narrative of the of the of today is that we are delivering an elixir, you know, a magical remedy for the uh, or, or, or a near magical remedy for the illness of the word of the world. And just as the elixir transmutes copper into gold, when restored by the divine elixir of the word, it is not to the previous state that one is restored. One isn't brought back to how one was before, but to a new state that is sublimated above the previous state. I just want to uh, briefly uh, shout out uh, the Broadway musical Hades Town, which does a beautiful job, uh, and it's still is playing on Broadway now, which does a beautiful job of retelling this Orpheus myth, uh, and it captures, I, I believe, some of these beautiful notes. So to pull these ideas together of the sort of the idea of, of revelation being seen as a category of poetry or song or music or art, uh, neither fiction nor nonfiction, um, I offer it's this beautiful uh, description by Arthur Agnew from a pilgrim note. He was in Akka for uh, a period of time in 1907, met with Abdu'l-Bahá and members of Abdu'l-Bahá's family and tried to describe the experience of meeting with Abdu'l-Bahá and tried to experience to describe the experience of being there in Akka. And in the end, he, he brings it into his reading of the, of the Kitab i Gan and, and, how it, it, and how the experience of reading the Kitab i Gan is similar. And uh, it's a bit of a long quote, but I think it, it's, uh, it's worth reading through and it's really quite beautiful. He said, the, and this is part way into the narrative. He says, the ocean of love was flowing. The cup of my heart was full and could take no more. This was the only barrier between him, Abdu'l-Bahá, and me. I could not touch him, though his hand lay lovingly upon my shoulder. I had nothing to offer, but he offered the fellowship of the kingdom, offered it all, everything, freely. I might take so much as I was able. He would have exchanged places with me, but I was not able. I had not the capacity. Over me rolled great billows of love, enough for all humanity. But that evening, the eye of my soul saw another vision and a glimpse into another world whose power is unequaled, which accomplishes its purpose without warfare or strife, without causing unhappiness or destruction, which is above opposition, to which the intellect cannot reach which loses nothing of its attraction because it is the same for all, one atom of which is sufficient for all creatures, while the rolling ocean of its power envelops all humanity and must accomplish the end for which he hath ordained it. It is the love of God. In that atmosphere, the one who created me laid his loving hand upon the heartstrings, struck the inner chord of my being, and within my soul, the song must sing. It is the song of the Redeemer, the song the sower sings as he goes forth to sow, and the song the reaper sings when he gathers in the golden grain. It is the song of existence, the song of life, the song of joy, the song of triumph. I realize my utter lack of power to express in words this wonderful spirit. I have tried it with some of my most intimate, close, and sympathetic friends and have not been able to carry its message. And to my own self, I must admit my failure, for when I attempt to describe this wonderful spirit, my words do not describe it to myself. I can only find the expression of this spirit in the word of Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l-Bahá. At times, when reading the book of Egon, the spirit of light, joy, and gladness has come over me, which I've not been able to ascribe to any word or sentence or to any one idea or thought. It has seemed like a radiance arising from the book, from the certainty of truth. So it's that place of certainty and that, and that place of, of love that I, I hope we can collectively at least um, have a glimpse of as we as we make our way into this text. 
before we start with the with the opening paragraphs, however, I just wanted to bring around two pieces of historical context that can help us uh, approach the text. And the first is that simply that it was written before it was revealed before Baha'u'llah's declaration around the year 1861 in defense of the prophetic claim of the Bab. So it's not Baha'u'llah writing about his own claim, but it's Baha'u'llah writing as a nominal follower of the Bab still at this point, and he's defending uh, and, and advocating for the cause of the Bab. And the second piece of historical context is that it's written in answer to specific questions uh, and I should also say under point one that Baha'u'llah's actual declaration took place in 1863. So this was really on the eve of his public declaration, but still in 1861, only maybe a few intimate uh, followers had any notion of what of what he was eventually going to claim. The second uh, piece of historical context is that it was written in answer to specific questions from an uncle of the Bab, who was himself a Shiite Muslim at this point. Um, and I believe it's the case that upon the receipt of the Kitab Yagan, it was enough to convince him. So the text is steeped in quotations and references that might strike Westerners as somewhat foreign. So it requires a bit of extra work sometimes to get through uh, and to understand uh, the references. It turns out that the actual questions asked of Baha'u'llah by this uncle of the Bab have been preserved historically. They were um, found in the papers of this gentleman and um, and I was, not recently, but certainly far, far after his death, but some decades ago they were found. And so we have the text of the actual questions that led to Baha'u'llah's revelation of the Kitab Yagan over the space of two days and two nights in 1861. And the details of these questions aren't going to be that relevant to our class, although um, I can provide those in the share drive if you want to get, if you want like an exact translation of these two pages of text. However, I've compared the 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 entirety of it with uh, Balyuzi's summary of these of these questions which was published in Baha'u'llah, the King of Glory. And this summary is, I think, sufficient. So the summary goes as follows. Haji Mirza Sayyid Muhammad, the uncle of the Bab, worded his questions to Baha'u'llah under four headings, namely, one, the day of resurrection. Is there to be corporeal resurrection? The world is replete with injustice. How are the just to be requited and the unjust punished? Two, the 12th Imam was born at a certain time and lives on, according to the Shiites. There are traditions all supporting the belief. How can this be explained? Three, interpretation of holy texts. This cause does not seem to conform with beliefs held throughout the years. One cannot ignore the literal meaning of holy texts and scriptures. How can this be explained? And four, certain events according to the traditions that have come down from the imams, must occur at the advent of the Qa'im, the, the promised one of the uh, for the Shiites. Some of these are mentioned, but none of these has happened. How can this be explained? So I suggest that these four questions of the Bab can, can be more or less well summarized in, in one fairly simple statement. If there's a God who wants to be known, why make it so difficult for us? <laughs> Why give us sacred texts that are so hard to understand? Why not speak clearly? Why not say, this is what I mean? Why, does, why say one thing and then seemingly do another thing? Why test us? Uh, I believe that's the kind of spirit behind these questions of the, of the Bob's uncle. And the answer to this is the entirety of the Kitab Yagan. So let's have a look at the opening paragraphs. And um, I only assigned the first five or, or was it six paragraphs to start with, although the, the pace of reading is going to uh, accelerate after this week because I knew that there was going to be a fair bit of time uh, at the at the opening just getting getting us started.
So let's look at these opening paragraphs. But as we'll see, there's really plenty, uh, plenty in these paragraphs already. And I also wanted to to invite anyone at, at any point to jump in. I'm not, um, I won't be derailed by by questions that are inserted into into my um, meanderings. So feel free to jump in at any point, including now if there's something that's that stuck out already at this point. My, I also have a question. My curiosity is, why was the uncle of the Bob asking these questions to Baha'u'llah and what conversations had they had prior to this that, that made him think that Baha'u'llah, you know, might have the answers? And what exactly were, were their correspondences, which may not be possible to answer? The, say, say that again, what, what might not be possible to answer? Or just, uh, just in general, it might not be known. Um, but you know, what were the what was the nature of their discussions with each other, and what were and what was the nature of their correspondence, the uncle of the Bob and Baha'u'llah, and and what did the uncle of the Bob think of Baha'u'llah? That I'm not sure we know, or if we do, it's still buried in in per, in in uh, memoirs written in Persian that haven't yet been translated into English. Um, there's certainly there's a mountain of information of this of this nature in uh that's still sort of locked away in Persian. Um that being said, I'm not sure if there's any more detail about their relationship than than what we have here and, and that what's implied by this detailed question and answer. Um, which is already more than we are, we have for most for most correspondence with Baha'u'llah. It, it's rare that we that we have the incoming question that gave rise to the answer. Um, Stephen, I also, uh, I've also understood from the story that there were two uncles that went and, and of course, this uncle that asked the questions, um, he, he, he was very uh, adamant to get these answers. But the, the other uncle who, who was younger was actually very upset that he was tricked to come with him to Baghdad and left and didn't want anything to do with it. So there was a mm -hmm. there was an interesting, you know, side story with the two uncles, right? With mm -hmm. the one wanting to know why did this happen to our nephew and the other one said that's it's already caused enough tragedy in our family. I don't want anything to do with it. He finally mm -hmm. comes around this younger uncle. Mm -hmm. but, um it took a while. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting de detail. I didn't know that. Yeah. Anyway, so opening paragraphs, um, let's have a look at the first paragraph, which uh, includes, which can be thought of as, as a kind of exordium, an introductory paragraph. Uh, the introductory paragraph is in Arabic, and the rest of the text is largely in Persian, although there's a great deal of Arabic quoted throughout. Uh, and so one who only knows Persian might find the Kitabi Gan fairly difficult, a fairly difficult read because of the uh, the amount of, uh, of Arabic. Uh, in this case, the opening paragraph is entirely in Arabic, and then Baha'u'llah kind of semi-translates it in the, in the second paragraph. He says, In the name of our Lord, the exalted, the Most High, no man shall attain the shores of the ocean of true understanding, except he be detached from all that is in heaven and on earth. Sanctify your souls, O ye peoples of the world, that happily ye may attain that station which God hath destined for you, and enter thus the tabernacle, which according to the dispensations of providence have been raised in the firmament of the Bayan. So immediately there's something that is promised. Uh, there's something that we're supposed to attain, ocean of true understanding, uh, which for the moment we can say is at, is at least going to be partially synonymous with certitude. Uh, the word for true understanding here uh, in the Arabic is is, uh, is Arafan. And it's important, I won't be doing a lot of, of um, because I don't want to bore everyone, I don't want to do a lot of referring to uh, um, uh, the uh, Persian vocabulary unless it's really necessary. But this is a case where it's actually, I think, quite necessary. Um, the word here that is translated as true understanding or Arafan is it has a deep history in Islam, particularly in the more mystical strains of Islam, as 
a complement to the word elm, both of which, uh, unfortunately, may be translated as knowledge in English, depending on context. Elm, the Baha'i month of Elm, is, is unambiguously knowledge, the kind of knowledge that one can learn from a book or, or from a teacher. Um, however, the second kind of knowledge, which is here is translated as true understanding or erfan, is rather that kind of knowledge which does, does not and cannot come through book learning, but it has to come through a kind of direct experience. And an example which is given by one of the one of the Sufi mystics is like knowing about fire, having heard about fire, read about it in a book, understanding the physics and the chemistry of fire, but never having been burned by the fire. And we have that clear intuition of the vast difference between knowing about fire, even seeing the, the flame, perhaps, uh, and being burned by that flame. And that's, in a nutshell, the, the distinction between uh, between Ilm and Erfan. And Baha'u'llah is, in the Kitab Egon, giving us the pathway to Erfan, uh, which is not the same as the pathway to knowledge. So the pathway to knowledge includes certain prerequisites of knowledge, of learning certain things that build upon other things having the right teacher to teach it, having the right books to read, and so forth. Erfan is, has a different set of prerequisites for it. And those prerequisites are given in this paragraph and in the following paragraph, and perhaps most famously in the middle of part two of the Egon, which we'll get to uh, in a few weeks. And these prerequisites are not the sort of prerequisites that one would perhaps intuitively imagine that one would have to fulfill in order to gain some kind of knowledge, because these prerequisites involve emptying out rather than filling up. You know, the, the, the ilm kind of knowledge, the book learning, oftentimes requires you to fill your head with other things as scaffolding for that additional bit of knowledge that you're not going to understand unless you have understood those things that came before it. Mathematics is a perfect example of that. Erfan has a different sort of scaffolding, and the scaffolding for Erfan is an emptying out of what you knew, not a filling up and a, and a um, uh, and a building of one thing upon the other. It's an emptying out, Baha'u'llah says, a detachment from all that is in heaven and on earth. And this already, this is sentence one, already this is a really incredible statement, because he's saying you have to be detached from all that is in heaven and on earth. Notice he says in heaven and on earth. So it isn't just detachment from worldly things. Although he does say that in, uh, in in another sentence or two, and the the emphasis is on detachment from worldly things, uh, idle imaginations, and so forth. We'll list these all out by the end. But also, we're asked to detach ourselves from what from that which is in heaven as well. And my take on this is that he's asking us to let go of our preconceived ideas about God and religion. And what is a prophet? And how do they function in the world? And what is spirit? All these sorts of fundamentals upon which we build the scaffolding of our religious conceptions, which we may largely share in common between Christians and Muslims and Jews, for example. In the, in the West, there's a, a relatively common scaffolding, a common conception of a creator God who sends prophets at, at intervals the prophets bring books. The books are uh, are carefully preserved by their followers. Uh, religions are built around those books and and the authoritative interpreters of those books. These are all, you know, elements of perhaps one's understanding of heaven and things heavenly. Uh, Baha'u'llah is asking us to let go of this. He's asking us to sanctify our souls, to attain a station which is destined for us. So we're meant to attain this station. And of course, it's in the relation to the firmament of the bayan that Baha'u'llah Baha is talking about this. So in paragraph two, Baha'u'llah is, is saying the essence of these words is this. So he's repeating in Persian and of course, expanding greatly on what he said in the in the Arabic. And in general, I'm not going to be reading aloud every, every paragraph. 
through the Egon, but th these two paragraphs are important enough that it, it I think really requires it. Uh, there'll be there'll be various paragraphs and pages that we're going to move through much more quickly than this. The essence of these words is this: They that tread the path of faith, they that thirst for the wine of certitude, must cleanse themselves of all that is earthly, their ears from idle talk, their minds from vain imaginings, their hearts from worldly affections, their eyes from that which perisheth. They should put their trust in God, and holding fast unto him, follow in his way. We'll come back to that sentence. Then will they be made worthy of the effulgent glories of the son of divine knowledge and understanding, and become the recipients of a grace that is infinite and unseen, inasmuch as man can never hope to attain unto the knowledge of the all-glorious, can never quaff from the stream of divine knowledge and wisdom, can never enter the abode of immortality, nor partake of the cup of divine nearness and favor, unless and until he ceases to regard the words and deeds of mortal men as a standard for the true understanding and recognition of God and his prophets. This is like really a mic drop moment because what, what is Baha'u'llah saying here at the very end? It's almost like an invitation to rebellion. He, he's saying this to a, to a group of people who grow up believing in an absolute authority of, 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 of the clerical class, both worldly and heavenly, over their affairs. Baha'u'llah is saying, you get to discount what they say when it comes to your interpretation of your understanding of your own path to the truth. Here lies the seeds of the um, of the elimination of the clergy as a category of person in the in this reconstruction of religion that Baha'u'llah is going to be um, outlining through the course of his of his ministry. And the seeds are already right here. The this independent investigation of reality this the is stated very clearly right here. And it's explicitly stated that this involves rejecting religious authority, re rejecting received religious authority. Now, we have to come back to it at some point, and this is where it gets really interesting, because, because Baha'u'llah has brought authority of his own. And, and there is, as, as the, the divine order, the new world order that Baha'u'llah brings, necessarily has its own authority, the authority of the House of Justice. and the um the interesting question here is what is the relationship between between the kind of freedom that Baha'u'llah is granting here in paragraph two of the Kitab Gan, the freedom to question received religious authority and the existence, the necessary continuing existence of some form of authority into the future. So we're going to come back to this. I also wanted to to come back briefly to this this um this sentence. They should put their trust in God and holding fast unto him follow in his way. Because on, on the face of it, this sounds a little bit like a circular argument, because what if someone is reading this saying, well, I don't know if I believe in God yet. I'm reading this book to get certitude about God. And Baha'u'llah says almost as a prerequisite to attaining it is you have to put your trust in God. So there's a little bit of a puzzle there to be, to be, uh, to be figured out. Uh, and I think it's puzzles like this, these sorts of Zen koan-like puzzles that force us to think differently about the nature of God and our relationship to God. Stephen, I thought also an interesting connection that I just thought of as you were speaking was also in paragraph six. One of the things was, it's not only that you have the um, ownership and autonomy to investigate reality for yourself, but the, the fact that others may disbelieve, you know, you don't have to be perturbed by that. You can have a detachment because this is a pattern. This happens yes. every time. Yes. So don't, you know, don't, don't be perturbed. Don't be worried about the dissension or, um, you know, when people may protest. And I thought that was an yes. interesting thing that not only do you have the authority, but don't be overly worried when yes. other people can't see things, can't see what yeah. you see. It's an old story. It's an old song and it gets sung yeah. from age to age. Um. So now we move to the to to um, 
past the first two paragraphs, which are so meaty and contain so much. And I'm going to come back and try to summarize them uh, at the end. Um, but let's finish these next few paragraphs first. So he introduces the question of the past. Consider the past, he says. How many both high and low have at all times yearningly awaited the advent of the manifestations of God in the sanctified persons of his chosen ones? How often have they expected his coming? How frequently have they prayed that the breeze of divine mercy might blow and the promised beauty step forth from behind the veil of concealment and be made manifest to all the world and whensoever the portals of grace did open and the clouds of divine bounty did rain upon mankind and the light of the unseen did shine above the horizon of celestial might. They all denied him and turned away from his face, the face of God himself. Refer ye to verify this truth to that which hath been recorded in every sacred book. And we're going to see in the next few dozen paragraphs, Baha'u'llah himself giving us a kind of thumbnail sketch of that of that historical record of um, of the uh, of the song being rejected every time it is sung. And of course, Baha'u'llah is setting up the as Catherine alludes, Baha'u'llah is setting up the um, understanding how it is that everyone seems to have rejected the Bob's message. So why is that? You know, why all the high and mighty clergy are supposed to know about these spiritual things? Why didn't they detect that fragrance if it's really there in the Bob's uh, in the Bob's writings? So Baha'u'llah is, is sort of inoculating the this this uncle of the Bob uh, against the the various um, uh, the various kinds of denials that were seen in his in his very day by looking at uh, at these historical examples. Ponder for a moment, he says, and reflect upon that which has been the cause of such denial on the part of those who have searched with such earnestness and longing. So he's even granting these people good faith, saying they looked in good faith for, for and waited in good faith for God to return in, in the form of another prophet. Their attack has been more fierce than tongue or pen can describe. Not one single manifestation of holiness hath appeared, but he was afflicted by the denials, the repudiation, and the vehement opposition of the people around him. Thus it hath been revealed. Oh, the misery of men! No messenger cometh unto them, but they laughed him to scorn. Again he saith, each nation hath plotted darkly against their messenger, to lay violent hold on him, and disputed with vain words to invalidate the truth. Hey, I have a question, Stephen. Yeah. Um, what uh, sometimes manifestation is used, in, and since you're a translator as well, sometimes messenger. Is there any is there any difference between those two words uh, in the translation? Yes. And why? Yes, messenger is usually a translation of the word rasul, rasul which is literally someone who gives a message. Um, and a mes a manifestation is usually a zahir or a mazhar, and it comes from a different root. And it come and it has a different meaning. And traditionally, the the messengers were considered to be of like a lower order than well, let's say, like prophets, kind of like Old Testament prophets, kind of like yeah, I guess like yeah, Ezekiel or Amos or something. Although like for Baha'u'llah, the prophets and messengers are all in the same status, so there, there's no point reiterating how people might have thought of, about it in the past. When Baha'u'llah is talking about manifestations or messengers, he's talking about individuals which, for for our purposes, occupy that same exalted station, which Baha'u'llah will describe in detail in part two of the Egon. And that station is one of a kind of midpoint between the that which is completely inaccessible and unknowable the the reality of of the true one uh of god and uh and the created world and uh, but they emphasize two different facets of their function as mediators between the 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 between god and man um and in, in one sense they're bringing a message like delivering here's the book and in another sense they're manifesting it's more like the sun that's shining uh and um <laughs> does it does it have something to do with kind of this debate kind of in islam and in christianity where like jesus is literally the son of god like god made incarnate god made flesh and muhammad is simply the messenger than the kind of the discrepancy in the playing off of the two and 
in Islam, they often talk about how Christians worship Jesus instead of worshiping God, but um, but Muhammad is different. It's the Quran and the word that's important. He's simply the messenger. Do you know what I mean? Is there, yes, is there that's also how, how modern day Muslims have attacked the Baha'is, is they've said, no, you worship Baha'u'llah like you were God. And there's plenty of quotations where Baha'u'llah seems to be saying, you know, I am God, or you know, when I when I move to look at that which lies within me, I you know I say I am God, but then again I I see that I'm coarser than clay. Baha'u'llah always, always, always is alive and aware of, and usually makes us aware of these twin stations of the manifestation at one and the same time. They can somehow be divine and human, and the Muslims are. I guess the, the the technical phrase for this you could say is high theophanology and and low theophanology. A, a theophanology is or, or your idea of of how God manifests Himself in the world. And Christians, you would say, have a high theophanology because they believe that Jesus is the incarnation of the logos, um, and and they believe as the as that second or as part of the Trinity. Uh, that therefore he's uh, effectively identical, identical to God. But Muslims have like a low theophanology. They don't see Muhammad as God incarnate, like the Je like the, like the Christians think of uh, of Jesus. Mah Muslims think of of Muhammad as a messenger, someone who was given a message and delivered it. Uh, so they don't have uh, and and naturally they look at Christians and say, you know, you're you're a over exalting your prophet by identifying with with the Godhead, that's a form of idolatry. Um, because for Muslims, they have this very rigid uh, and robust sense of 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 monotheism in the sense of God being so great and so mighty and so beyond that it is a form of impiety to try to connect anything to God. And that's the the crime of the of the Christians on the one hand and the Baha'is on the other hand, because both of us talk about our prophets in such exalted terms. But uh, but there's a long tradition of people, not just prophets, making these sorts of outrageous claims. You know, Al Halaj is as one example that just comes to mind of uh, of, of a famous uh, uh, Islamic Muslim mystic who said, "An al Haq, I am the true one," uh, and he got himself burned at the stake for that um it's the it's and as baha'u'llah will explain later and and maybe we'll we'll return to this uh in part two of the Agon, it's in light of this of this of the twin stations occupied by by the prophets one can understand both kind of simultaneously it's a matter of perspective just like if you're looking at the sun in the mirror you can say that's the sun and you're absolutely 100% right and you can say that's the mirror and you're also 100% right and your finger doesn't move 1 millimeter when you're pointing at that at that mirror because in both cases you're pointing at the same thing but the thing that you're saying it is 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 relative to to perspective and and i, I it's a very simple analogy but i think it to my mind, it, it very help, helpfully resolves this apparent tension between manifestation as God incarnate and manifestation as as mere as mere human. As as you're describing that, it does it sounds like uh, when you talk about the high theophanology and low, it's as though the pendulum was swung in one direction and the Quran pulls it, but the Muslims pulled it so much in the other direction that it's 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 almost like a bringing together of those two. But through this use of paradox, right? I mean, it's like, you know, to hold two things as, you know, it's like, that's not the, that is the sun, but that is also the mirror. And it's like, yeah. that's the position you have to hold, which is, mm -hmm. is a, is, is challenging, I think, or abstract. Yeah. Yeah. And the pendulum swung, I mean, before the Christians, you had the Jews and that was also a low, a low theophanology. Yeah. I mean, Jews never talk about Moses as god incarnate and moses is, is a messenger right and uh who knows where the pendulum will end it, well, it which strikes is why me that, it's, which sorry. Is why one reason why it's 
really important, I think, when Baha'is speak to Christians that they don't say, oh, you know, all the prophets of God, like Moses and Abraham and Jesus and Muhammad and Baha'u'llah, mm -hmm. like to lump Jesus in as kind of a prophet is a really, can be a very insulting thing to a Christian, that to a Christian, you know, Jesus is, is God made flesh, is God incarnate, is literally the son of God on earth and has a, a, an incredibly special station. And I'm not saying that in teaching Christians, we, you know, change our philosophy, but be sensitive in how we describe these special, you know, kind of divine teachers and avatars so that mm -hmm. it, it allows for the, the sacredness of the station of Jesus to not just be one among a hundred of Old Testament prophets. I think I think that's a great point. I think there are, I think Baha'is especially can understand that there are different language games, to use a phrase from 20th century philosophy, um, by which to describe the sacred. And it seems to me that we should feel comfortable using different language language games or or different, you know, speaking in in sort of different theological frameworks understanding that all of these are different routes to to one reality you know like the the bahai temples have all have nine sides because there's there's all these different ways in that come from very different directions but they end at the same at the same reality and um and i think there's i believe there's more space for us to to speak you know depending on our audience to speak in a way that's you know that that matches the the vibe of that audience, so to speak. Because we know we know that all of these kinds of languages are are relative, relative to time and place and and circumstance. And that's one thing that really distinguishes Baha'u'llah's message is that when we're talking about things spiritual, things beyond the direct perception of the senses, what is said about them and what people have believed about them over the ages has been a function of the exigencies of the day. It's been a function of what's the need. You could say in modern terms, what what's the what's the psychology behind it, you know? And and not so much what's the ultimate reality of things. Because the ultimate reality we have no access to. All of our different conceptions of God, whether high or low theophanology or what have you, um, are all ways of orienting human action in in the direction which is ultimately directionless, because there's no there's no word or concept that actually describes it. So all we have in the end is how that translates into human action in the world. In a way that that lets us go, that sort of releases us from this whole kind of preoccupation with the with the detailed minutia of the theological level that has so overtaken. I think certain certain communities um, in the past. I'm sure we're going to respond to uh, re return to this point more more than once as we as we move along. Thank you, Stephen. So so paragraph four. Ponder for a moment and reflect upon that which hath been the cause of such denial on the part of those who have searched with such earnestness and longing. Um, oh, I already read this. Now we're on to paragraph five. Yeah. In like manner, those words that have streamed forth, forth from the source of power and descended from the heaven of glory are innumerable and beyond the ordinary comprehension of man. To them that are possessed of true understanding and insight, the surah of Hud surely sufficeth. This is one of the surahs of the Quran. And Hud is one of the Arabian prophets of which very little um, remains of, of what he said or who he was. Ponder a while those holy words in your heart and with utter detachment strive to grasp their meaning. Examine the wondrous behavior of the prophets and recall the defamations and denials uttered by the children of negation and falsehood. Perchance you may cause the bird of the human heart to wing its flight away from the abodes of heedlessness and doubt into the nest of faith and certainty and drink deep from the pure waters of ancient wisdom and partake of the fruit of the tree of divine knowledge. Such is the share of the pure in heart of the bread that hath descended from the realms of eternity and holiness. I just want to say, growing up as a Baha'i, I I didn't think twice about these these um, kinds of sentences 
they were just very natural and normal to me. I was immersed from it from a young age. But sometimes when I try to step outside it and look at it, I realize this might this might read very strangely to someone who's not familiar with it because it's chock full of metaphors. There's fruits and there's cups and there's rivers <clears throat> and there's bread and there's birds and there's all sorts of things. And I think it, it's it's useful it's, it, to take a moment and just appreciate what Bahá'u'lláh is trying to do. Yeah. He has these words, erfan, iran, which is certitude, iman, which is faith. And okay, we have those three words, but he can't just keep repeating those words. And he has no other way of describing what they are except by recourse to metaphor. He can't say faith, he can't say certitude is this, otherwise the book would be would be done in a paragraph. He has to get at it through this seemingly oblique way of talking about birds and fruits and trees and these and these sorts of things, because that's the only way he can do it. So final paragraph for today. Should, should you acquaint yourself with the indignities heaped upon the prophets of God and apprehend the true causes of the objections voiced by their oppressors, you will surely appreciate the significance of their position. Moreover, the more closely you observe the denials of those who have opposed the manifestations of the divine attributes, the firmer will be your faith in the cause of God. That's the cause of the, of the Bob today. Accordingly, a brief mention will be made in this tablet of diverse accounts relative to the prophets of God, that they may demonstrate the truth that throughout all ages and centuries, the manifestations of power and glory have been subjected to such heinous cruelties that no pen dare describe them. Perchance, this may enable a few to cease to be perturbed by the clamor and protestations of the divines and the foolish of this age and cause them to strengthen their confidence and certainty. So the next week we're going to start, uh, we're going to look successively at, at Noah and Moses and Jesus and Muhammad and so forth. So let's try to summarize a little bit. First of all, something's being promised here. Certitude, faith, true understanding, you know, Iran, Iman, Erfan, and which is different from knowing something in the bookish sense of it. And only metaphors, apparently, can really describe it. Catching a fragrance, hearing a song, eating the bread, eating the fruit, so forth. So it can only be uh, reached uh, at, sort of at, an, at an angle, so to speak. There are prerequisites needed to attaining, and we're going to hear a lot more about these in part two, but it has something to do with something very, very counterintuitive, which is emptying out rather than adding in the thing that's going to help you understand the next thing. You have to empty out from the whatever opinions you may have held beforehand. So the thing to be avoided to attain this is all that is in heaven and on earth, all that is earthly, idle talk, vain imaginings, worldly affections, that which perisheth, and finally the words and deeds of mortal men. All of these have to be um, scrupulously avoided to get to this station of, of true understanding. And I just wanted also to underline this vast implication for religious power structures of today, this granting of full spiritual responsibility to individuals to accomplish their own investigation of reality with or without the clergy, with or without the, the vaunted opinions of the people around them. And um, and I just also want to mention that it sounds a little bit like a scientific approach, um, a scientific approach to spiritual matters. There's a phrase in Latin, nullius in verba, which loosely translates to take no one's word for it, which is the motto of the Royal Society of London, which is the Academy of Sciences uh, in England. Um, and what Bahá'u'lláh seems to be saying here sounds a little bit similar. He's saying, take no one's word for it. Read it for yourself and encounter it yourself. That's the only way you're going to come into this, not by it being related to you by someone who is supposedly in authority.